Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. My name is Ethan. Today, we're going to be reacting to the second half of the Congress of Vienna Part 1 by Historia Civilis. This is basically Part 2 of Part 1. In my last video, we reacted to the first half of this video. So, I uh, hope you guys are ready to get into it. Uh, it was very enjoyable watching the first half, and I'm excited to watch the second half. So, let's get started. Alexander's stated priorities going into the peace conference kind of depended on his mood, but it mostly had to do with the future of France. Mm. As previously discussed, the Allies had all agreed to restore the old Bourbon dynasty to the French throne. The problem was that Alexander didn't like the Bourbon kings. <laughs> if you look at France's position in Europe, France had an interest in making sure that Central Europe remained fragmented and weak and yeah. outside of the influence of any other great power. To these ends, France had a long history of aligning itself with countries like Poland and Saxony and the Ottoman Empire. This was, of course, a geopolitical thing, but Tsar Alexander thought it was a personal thing. And of course, that the of course he did. Uniquely had a problem with Russia. Alexander's immediate priority was to keep the Bourbon Louis XVIII off of the French throne. He suggested making Napoleon's four-year-old son the king of France, but Talleyrand patiently explained to him that this would allow Napoleon to pull the strings from yeah, exile. Yeah, it's just not going to happen, Alexander. Alexander then tried to put a man named Bernadotte on the French throne. Bernadotte was a former French marshal who had turned against Napoleon and was single-handedly responsible for bringing Sweden into the coalition against France. In the late stages of the war, Bernadotte and Alexander had worked closely together, and Alexander viewed him as the one Frenchman he could trust. <laughs> Alexander pushed hard for Bernadotte, but Talleyrand wouldn't budge. He and the Allies had all agreed on a Bourbon restoration, and they all saw Bernadotte for what he was, an attempt to put a Russian puppet on the French throne. Yeah. Talleyrand explained to Alexander that they couldn't be placing whomever they wished on the French throne, or they were no better than the revolutionaries. The new king needed to be a legitimate French king of royal blood. Al yeah, I mean, if you're of that perspective, like, we should put another king on the throne, then Talleyrand makes a good point. You shouldn't be putting willy-nilly whoever you want on the throne. You should put, you know, who is l legitimate in the eyes of the other European monarchs. Alexander got desperate. What about a distant cousin, a younger brother, anybody but Louis XVIII? Talleyrand held firm, and Alexander backed down. An impressive feat, considering that the Russians had Paris under military occupation. A Bourbon king would return to the French throne, and Alexander's dream of a grand Franco-Russian alliance withered and died. For now. Austria. mentioned the Austrian foreign minister before, and how he had a rather dim opinion of the Russian Tsar. Biggest baby on earth, and all that. The Austrian foreign minister's name was Clemens von Metternich. Very, very famous statesman. He, this man is basically known as the man who would design the concert of Europe, you know, the sort of international system that would come to dominate European international politics for a long time to come. So Metternich has a lot of influence. And the period we're beginning to cover today is sometimes called the Age of Metternich. Yes. That's a clue as to his importance. <laughs> right. Metternich would become the architect of the post-war international system yep. and one of the 19th century's most preeminent figures. Metternich's task was vastly harder than it seemed because not only was the international system undergoing a stark transformation at the time, but so was Austria. Of course, what I'm referencing here is the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire. And now my punishment for bringing up the Holy Roman Empire <laughs> is that I have to explain what it was. Oh, no. We should begin with the French philosopher Voltaire's famous quote, quote that the Holy Roman Empire is neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. Right. So what was it? The Holy Roman Empire was a central European institution that had existed in one form or another for over a thousand years. I say institution because the Holy Roman Empire was by no means a state. Each member of the empire conducted its own foreign policy with its own military under its own laws. 
hundreds of tiny states were members of this club, yeah. this institution. And together, they loosely supported a central emperor. The Holy very Roman loosely. <laughs> was a prestigious title with very little actual power behind it. Yeah. He could call for aid if one of the member states was attacked, but it was up to each independent state whether or not they would respond. In fact, each state had its own unique deal worked out with the imperial crown, which put further limits on the emperor's power. Well, yeah, one of the reasons the Holy Roman Empire is so complex is not only is it hundreds of little member states, but every member state is governed differently, has a different setup, and a different relationship with the overall structure of the HRE and the Emperor. So it's just extremely complex. Power. Some were expected to contribute money to military campaigns, but no soldiers. Some were expected to contribute soldiers, but no money. Some were under no obligation to offer anything at all. Hmm. By the 17th century, the Holy Roman Emperor could no longer even have an opinion on religious matters, which right. kind of defeats the whole purpose of the holy part of their title. Although the imperial crown was remarkably weak, the Holy Roman Emperor usually controlled the most powerful state within the empire. Beginning in the 15th century and continuing up until the Napoleonic Wars, that meant that the Holy Roman Emperor was the Archduke of Austria. Yes. Since the 13th century, Austria had been controlled by the Habsburg family. The Habsburgs were one of the most powerful families in Europe, and at times over the last 500 years, they had controlled Portugal, Spain, the Netherlands, the Kingdom of Germany, parts of Northern Italy, Austria, Hungary, Croatia, Bohemia, I could go on. The dynasty was remarkably successful, and what made it especially remarkable is that very little of this territory was gained through conquest. Right. It was instead gained diplomatically. The Austrian Habsburgs had a family motto, let others wage war, but thou, happy Austria, marry. For those kingdoms that Mars gives to others, Venus gives to thee. <laughs> others conquer through war. The Habsburgs conquer through marriage. Yes. You can see the difference in the philosophy of Austria and Prussia. Prussia was very much on the side of conquering through war, and they were very successful in that. Austria wanted to marry their way to the top of Europe, and they were also quite successful, though, by this point, they were starting to see some limits to their success. And, you know, throughout the 1800s, the coming century... Uh, they would begin to see failings in their style of governance and uh, overall empire. Fast forward to the 19th century. The Holy Roman Emperor was still in Austrian Habsburg, now facing an expansionist France under Napoleon. He learned too late that the Holy Roman Empire was not equipped to face a direct attack. Yeah. A victorious Napoleon demanded the abolition of the Holy Roman Empire, and the Habsburg Emperor, having decided that this powerless husk was no longer worth defending, agreed. With that, Austria became fully independent under its first emperor, Francis I. I lay all of that groundwork because by 1814, Austria was at a crossroads. The new Empire of Austria had played a critical role in the defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte. But now what? They could reform the Holy Roman Empire if they wished, but did they wish? When push came to shove, some of the largest members of the empire sided with Napoleon. If the Holy Roman Empire wasn't a military alliance, what good was it? Yes, the title was prestigious, but you could argue that the restrictions within the empire only slowed Austria down with no clear benefit. Yeah. Francis, the former Holy Roman Emperor and the current Austrian Emperor, was sympathetic to this point of view, as was his foreign minister, Metternich. Metternich is sometimes described as a conservative or a reactionary, but that's not quite right. A true reactionary would have fought to reform the Holy Roman Empire, but Metternich happily allowed it to die. He was a realist, not that concerned with ideology, so long as it protected his hard-won peace. 
In his excellent and definitive biography of Metternich, Wolfram Zeman writes that, quote, This, the question of whether Metternich was reactionary, disregards the experiences of human beings who were looking back at 25 years of war and revolution. The question contemporary witnesses asked themselves was whether the more than 3 million dead on the battlefields of Europe had died for any meaningful goal. Right. In many peasant families, there were no male youths left. That 3 million number is on the lower end of the spectrum. Yeah, I mean, Metternich did not want to conserve what existed prior to the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars he just wanted to he would go on to want to preserve his system his concert of europe in in that way he's called a conservative also because he was extremely anti-liberal but he wasn't you know some reactionary he was trying to go back to the way things were he understood that things had already changed and there was no going back and you know he had to maneuver around those changes I've seen credible estimates of 5 to 7 million when you include civilians. Wow. Unthinkable loss. Yeah. Nobody who lived through this period would ever be the same. Across France, 20% of the men born between 1790 and 1795 were dead. Insane. An entire generation of young men had been wiped out. In that same book, Zeman provides the best summary of Metternich's worldview that I've ever seen. In Metternich's case, coming to terms with the war meant considering the suffering he had witnessed endless times on the battlefields and along the roads. Mm. Unnecessary, pointless, even a crime caused by human delusions of grandeur that, he thought, could pull down the walls protecting civilization and the law as he understood it, at any time and in any place. It was the duty of politics to erect enduring barriers against this possibility. He opposed this catastrophe on humanitarian grounds, and his lasting commitment was never again. Which, I mean, you could say he achieved. I mean, his system really saw a lack of uh, warfare and violent conflict within Europe, mostly. So... Uh, in that sense, you could definitely say he achieved his goal, though I'm, I'm a little skeptical about him, you know, uh, doing it for humanitarian reasons, but, you know, I, I think there probably was some truth in that. Nick saw balance between great powers right. as the answer. He feared a second French Revolution, or yes. something like it, but he couldn't clearly see how Austria could possibly prevent one. However... With a balanced international system, any state seeking to dominate could simply be slapped down by everybody else. Exactly. This theory for peace played into Austrian strengths. Ever since the French Revolution, Austria had positioned itself as the defender of precedent and tradition and the rule of law. Accordingly, they began to expand their diplomatic influence and cultivate a following of smaller states, especially in Central Europe who feared being swallowed up by the regional instability that would inevitably follow the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire. Before proceeding, it would be helpful to discuss what the Austrian Empire actually was. (laughs) What we're really talking about here is the personal holdings of the Habsburg family which included the lands that had been the Duchy of Austria, but it also included the Kingdom of Hungary, the Kingdom of Bohemia. Yeah, I mean, the Holy Roman Empire is far more confusing, but, you know, the Austrian Empire itself is not a uh, a simple, uh, you know, state. It was formed of the personal holdings of the Habsburg family, like Astoria Civilis says, uh, many different polities and principalities and regions and each one mostly had their own thing going on, which would become, uh, and already had become, quite a struggle when, you know, the royal family tried to implement centralizing reforms. Well, when you've got a bunch of different regions in your country that have their own traditions and politics, it's very difficult to bring everyone together. And this would obviously be shown in the, you know, the dual Austrian-Hungarian monarchy when Hungary got a large level of autonomy later in the century. So, you know, the the Austrian Empire itself was very complex. 
Latvia, the Kingdom of Croatia, along with a hodgepodge of other titles. Yeah. It may be helpful to look at the ethnic breakdown of the Austrian Empire, because this will tell you everything you need to know about Austrian politics. First and foremost, there was the German-speaking core, centered around Vienna and the old Duchy of Austria. Then, there were the Magyars of Hungary, who spoke Hungarian. The third major group were the Bohemians, who spoke Czech. Then, in the borderlands, there were Croats, Serbs, Slovaks, and others, who spoke various Slavic languages. To the east, there was Transylvania, whose inhabitants spoke Romanian. There were also regions where the majority spoke Polish and Ukrainian. And although right. this wasn't the case at this exact moment, the Austrian Empire would soon have a large Italian minority as well. And this, this is a good map to show some of the divisions in the empire. Though it is worthwhile remembering that in all of their these regions, there was a lot of intermingling. So if you had like a real map of, uh, you know, population distribution, it would be a mess of different populations and ethnic groups. Of course, there was certainly groupings, and, and this map is accurate in that sense. But just remember that there was a ton of mixing going on, uh, which makes it even more complicated when you want to give, you know, I mean, if you if you want to give Hungary autonomy, well, there's other ethnic groups in Hungary, so it, it's very complicated. By one count, the Austrian Empire consisted of 14 ethnic groups speaking 17 different languages. The Austrian Empire was really an incredible experiment, one that you don't see anywhere else in the 19th century. This was not the case of one ethnic group dominating their neighbors. This was a true synthesis of cultures and ethnicities united under the Habsburg Emperor. In the eyes of the Habsburg- I mean, yes, but the Austrians did always have a predominant role. Um, but I do agree with more than any other empire, there was definitely a sharing of power around the different ethnic groups. That's definitely true. For Emperor, all of these holdings were at least theoretically co-equal, which made administering the yeah, empire the world's most complicated balancing act. <laughs> yes. The constraints within the Habsburg system become clear when you look at the crown's relationship with the Kingdom of Hungary. Yes, this is the best example. The Kingdom of Hungary was home to more than just the ethnic... Well, there you go. So, like, like I was just saying, I'm glad Historias Civilis has showed this. Here's the Kingdom of Hungary. Does that look like just Hungarians to you? No, we've got clearly large and spread out populations of Germans. In Transylvania, we've got a lot of Romanians. We've got Slovaks up north. Uh, we've got Ukrainians in the Northeast. I mean, this is a very diverse population, um, as I'm sure he's about to get to. I'm, I'm very glad he showed this map. In the Hungarian population. And when you add everybody together, it accounted for 35 to 40% of the Austrian Empire's total population. Yeah, very that large. fact alone should make it clear why there was tension between the Austrian Germans and the Hungarians. Yeah. The Habsburg Emperor ruled Hungary as their king, but he was not one of them. And so he was bound by severe constitutional limitations. One of these limitations was that the Hungarian king was not allowed to tax the people of Hungary. The local Hungarian aristocracy was allowed to tax the people, but they were... And this obviously made governmental functions very difficult when you do not have control over taxation. Um, you know, Maria Theresa and uh, Joseph II ran into a lot of issues trying to implement reforms, particularly in Hungary because of the lack of power and the constitutional checks they held. Whenever they tried to implement reforms, particularly taxation reforms, you know, the local nobility would mostly just ignore them or say no, or say, traditionally, you don't have these rights. You, have, you don't have the right to implement these reforms or tax us. So it was very difficult for the emperor to exercise a lot of authority over the kingdom of Hungary. They were under no obligation to pass that money along to their king. Yeah. Again, this is 35 to 40 percent of the empire's population we're talking about. This exemption created a massive hole in the imperial budget that huh. Austria was constantly trying to fill. Right. Over the centuries, this arrangement resulted in the Hungarian aristocracy becoming extremely rich, even yes. though the Hungarian people remained quite poor compared to the German-speaking population. Oh, yes. Um, you know, Hungary remained very feudal very late. So compared to Austria, 
you know, the Hungarian nobles were these rich feudal landlords, and the Hungarian peasants, who may be better termed serfs, were extremely impoverished and destitute, um, partially because the crown, uh, the Habsburg crown, you know, couldn't uh, influence or help their situation as they could in Austria. ...to the West. The Hungarian king was also constrained when it came to military recruitment. Yeah. Despite being home to 35 to 40 percent of the Austrian Empire, Hungarian subjects only made up like 5 percent of its military. This number could fluctuate. During the Napoleonic Wars, it climbed as high as 20 percent. But in order to accomplish that, the Habsburg Emperor had to go to the Hungarian aristocracy and give them whatever they wanted. Yeah. This tenuous constitutional relationship meant that Austria was cursed, in a way, to be in constant negotiations with itself. Yeah. The Hungarians were always suspicious of any territorial gains that added more ethnic Germans to the empire. The whole political system was a delicate balance. It's and not an efficient Germans way to run a government. The Hungarians always wanted something, too. Despite all of its contradictions, the Austrian Empire had a lot of credibility on the international stage. Whatever the reasons, the fact that Austria was not primarily concerned with territorial expansion mattered a lot, especially to all of those tiny Central European states who had recently been made vulnerable by the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire. Mm. It meant that despite having the weakest military of the great powers, Austria had a lot of friends at a time when having a lot of friends was a valuable thing to have. None of this was true of the other German great power. Ah. In many ways, Austria's mirror opposite. Yes. Where Austria was old, they were young. Where Austria young, was defined ambitious. by their diversity, they were defined by their Germanness. Warlike. Where Austria was weaker militarily than they could be, they were stronger militarily than they yes. ought to be. Yes, on to where Prussia. Austria was not that interested in territorial expansion, they were obsessed with it to the point where they thought of very little else. <laughs> the two German great powers were brothers, but they were brothers that did not get along. Right. Here we are. The new kid on the block. Prussia. In 1814, the thing that defined Prussia was its precarity. It was the smallest of the great powers in every way. It had a tiny population of 10 million people, three times less populous than France, and almost five times less populous than Russia. Mm. It was also small geographically. As you can see, its tiny population was crammed into a bunch of isolated pockets that weren't even connected to each other. It was also precarious in its positioning. Yes. As I've already discussed, Central Europe was no longer under the protection of the Holy Roman Empire, which meant that tiny Prussia was now vulnerable to its much larger neighbors. Vulnerable might be underselling it. The Prussians had enlisted Russian help against the French, but now there were Russians everywhere. Poland was under joint Russian and Prussian occupation, but there were also Russians occupying the Polish-speaking areas of eastern Prussia, and they weren't leaving. The Russians were also occupying Saxony along Prussia's southern border, and these guys weren't leaving either. Central Europe was in a state of flux. It was clear to everybody that Russia saw opportunity here, which was entirely antithetical to the balance of power principle. The other great powers would have no choice but to respond. In the eyes of people like Metternich and Castlereagh, Russia had to remove itself from Central Europe if there was ever to be peace. <laughs> it's lucky Prussia for Russia. had to become the kind of great power that was capable of resisting Russian influence. And Prussia's in a precarious position at this moment, but it has grown immensely over the past hundred years. I mean, go back to 1700. And Prussia really isn't much more than a small principality. You know, through mainly the efforts of Frederick I and Frederick II, who we know as Frederick the Great, Prussia expanded massively through a lot of conquests, a lot of successful conquests, and through building up one of the most ferocious militaries in Europe, despite its small size. Um, so, you know, the Prussia in this position is so much different and so much more powerful than Prussia had been not that long ago.
That was the priority of the Prussian Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, Karl August von Hardenberg. Mm. The experience with Napoleon had taught Hardenberg that Prussia was not yet a true great power. It was powerful regionally, but it was too small to have a global impact. Yeah. In order to graduate from a regional power to a great power, Prussia needed people, Prussia needed resources, and Prussia needed territory. This line between a strong regional power and a weak great power is a fuzzy one. Eric Hobsbawm writes that, quote, Austria and Prussia were really great powers by courtesy only. Continuing later, their chief function was to act as European stabilizers. It's true that Austria and Prussia could not match the global influence of France, Britain, and Russia. Yeah. I would quibble slightly and say that Austria's diplomatic influence at this time made them a great power, but it's true that Prussia lacked the global reach of any of the other powers. The only reason everybody decided to treat them as a great power was their formidable military. By the end of the war, on a per capita basis, Prussia was fielding six times more soldiers than Austria, which meant that despite their relative weakness, they were capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with any other great power. Yup. Hardenberg saw in Prussia an urgent need for territorial expansion. All of these isolated enclaves would not do. They were just asking to be swallowed up by some stronger power. In the upcoming peace conference, Prussia hoped to gain some territorial coherence and become a true great power with global influence. Ah, oh, the Congress. And just another point on Prussia. You know, I said how far they'd come over the last hundred years or so. Think about it. This is 1814. Uh, give them another less than 60 years, <laughs> and Prussia will become Germany, one of the most powerful European states of all time. So Prussia's moving fast, you know, in the span of about 200 years or so, they're going from a small principality to a weak great power to perhaps the most powerful great power, um... And they always had an eye on territorial gains, as you can see here. On to the Congress. The original plan was for the four victorious great powers, Britain, Russia, Austria, and Prussia, to dominate the peace conference and impose their will upon everyone else. Mm. But Tsar Alexander's behavior had begun to make people nervous, and <laughs> Russia's creeping domination over Prussia seemed a disaster waiting to happen. Yeah. If there was a serious split at the conference, with Britain and Austria on one side and Russia and Prussia on the other, it was difficult to imagine how they could possibly resolve it without descending into another war. Metternich and Castlereagh saw this looming crisis before them, and so they approached Talleyrand and asked him to represent France at Vienna. Mm. France remained a great power, and so it made very little sense to exclude them from shaping the post-war world. Besides, yeah. Napoleon Bonaparte had been defeated and removed from power, which meant that France was theoretically a normal country again. Naturally, nothing could have pleased Talleyrand more. Of course. Castlereagh and Metternich pulled in Hardenberg of Prussia, who was still keen on finding a way to resist Russian influence, and got him to agree. This left Tsar Alexander isolated when the four other great powers came to him and demanded that France be given a seat at the Congress. He, of course, threw a fit, but then reluctantly agreed. Typical. <laughs> Over the summer, everybody traveled to Vienna. And by everybody, I mean everybody. <laughs> Virtually every state in Europe sent delegations. And some states that didn't even exist anymore sent delegations as well. After Poland? decades of war, a festive, slightly euphoric mood took over the city. Yeah. Peace was at hand. When September rolled around, the real work began. Oh, outro songs coming. Classic, classic Astoria Civilis outro. 
Where, I mean, could you imagine being in Vienna that summer? You've got, like, all the statesmen and diplomats of Europe converging on this city after you've just ended a decades-long war. I mean, it really must have been euphoric. It's hard to even imagine. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was a fantastic video. I cannot wait for the second part of the Congress of Vienna. I'm sure it'll take a while, considering how immense this video was. But yeah, that, that was truly entertaining, interesting. Another great one from Historia Civilis. So yeah, if you guys enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe. And if you have suggestions for what else I should react to, leave them in the comments. Hope you guys like this one, and I will see you again next time. Goodbye.